our main story tonight concerns chemicals. Specifically, we're going to be talking about a particular class of chemicals tonight called PFAS. These compounds are among the most toxic compounds we know. He's right. The bad news is these chemicals can double our risk or worse of some terrible cancers. Thankfully, there is good news because we figured out how to dramatically reduce our exposure. It's not what you think, and that's what this episode is all about. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, wait, what are PFOSs, and if they are such a big deal, why haven't I heard about them? Their story is so unbelievable, I don't think you could write it as fiction. It's the subject of a major motion picture starring The Incredible Hulk. That's my secret, Cap. I'm always angry. also known as Mark Ruffalo. The movie is Dark Waters and also stars Anne Hathaway. Do you hear yourself? You are acting like a crazy person, tearing up our floor, scaring me half to death. I know it's my job to support you, but that does not mean you get to come into our home, to our family, and tell me that our unborn child is being poisoned. No! I'm sorry. Can I please explain? Explain what? All of it. And if, if you still think I'm crazy, I'll drop it. Think Aaron Brockovich. By the way, we had that water brought in special for you folks. Came from Well and Hinkley. But that was about regional contamination of chromium. PFAS has circled the globe and is now in all of us. Yeah, you know, we're now talking about probably one of the, the biggest environmental contamination stories in history. And most of us still don't know about it. Wow. You know, we know about Flint, Michigan, yeah. one water supply, yet yeah. here we're talking about something that's in water all over the world, in all of our blood, in animals, polar bears, eagles. The book about it is called Exposure, and it's by the lawyer you just heard, and it reads like a Grisham legal thriller. It made my list of the 50 most riveting books I've ever read. PFOSs are a family of thousands of chemicals invented by man that don't exist in nature. Their properties are miraculous and brought us Teflon pans and Stainmaster carpets. Don't make a meal without that seal, DuPont, DuPont, DuPont. It ain't no deal without that no stick seal, here's what you want. Without these seals, you're out of luck. Don't get stuck. The most astonishing part of the story, and this is true, the companies that make these chemicals, DuPont and 3M, managed to keep secret how toxic they are for many decades, keeping it from both the EPA and us. That by the 1960s, DuPont and 3M knew that PFAS could be toxic. That by the 1970s, DuPont and 3M knew that PFAS was indeed building up in the blood of all of us and harming their own workers. So they were able to dump unimaginable amounts into the ocean, rivers, lakes, and landfills, causing innumerable deaths of humans and animals. Some of you may know that I was an earth scientist working in water testing in the 80s. You may wonder, how could I and the entire scientific community miss these chemicals and leave it up to a lawyer and farmer to uncover DuPont's dark secret? I am a corporate defense attorney. So? I defend chemical companies. Well, now you can defend me. How many did you lose? 190. 190 cows. You tell me nothing's wrong here. For me, I thought these chemicals were inert, so how could they harm anything? They are the most stable organic chemicals known. They don't react with anything. So they're known as forever chemicals because they don't biodegrade. I thought it would be like swallowing sand. Most sand is quartz, so it's so stable it doesn't harm us. But it turns out that PFOS bioaccumulates in our body, binding to proteins like in the liver, kidneys, and our blood, and stays for a very long time. Somehow they wreck our immune system so we can't fight off certain cancers and other horrible diseases. For example, this is how children respond to childhood vaccines like for diphtheria when PFOS levels increase in their blood. The PFOSs here are in the marine food chain. There was a range of concentrations of PFAS and P4 in the blood of these children. And when the PFAS or P4 was doubled, when it was increased by a factor of two, the child would lose 50% of the antibody uh, toward the vaccine, meaning that the child was not responding appropriately, optimally, 
to the vaccination. And, and the more PFOS and P4 they had in the blood, the greater the risk that the vaccines had not worked. Over the years, the EPA kept lowering their levels of what they deemed to be safe. And now this is what they say. EPA, just in March of this year, said that there's no safe level of some of these PFAS to ingest. None. So how do we know for sure how toxic these chemicals are when DuPont and 3M have always denied it? We do not believe there are any adverse health effects. What I can say is the weight of scientific evidence does not establish that PFAS causes adverse human health effects. Turns out there are great heroes in this story like the victims. When they got a settlement from DuPont, this happened. Generally with the settlement, people just want to be done with it. They want to get their cash, they want to walk. But what happened in the case of C8 was really radically different. Rather than just take that money provided by DuPont under the settlement and divide it up among the class members and walk away, what we decided to do was set up something we called the C8 Science Panel. That was a sacrifice on the part of the people who had won the money, but it was one that could have turned out paying off for everybody in the world. DuPont remains confident the test results will prove C8 is safe, but a lot depends on how many take the test. It's my belief that when DuPont settled this case, they had predetermined that no epidemiological study could be done large enough to ever get a link. And with no link, the jury comes back, you're innocent. And you can never be tried again. And what we'd said is, we've got a group of people that we know have been drinking it for, for years. We want this independent panel to look at what does this chemical do to these, these folks and tell us whether there's a, a health effects or there aren't health effects. Both sides had the ability to pick three completely independent, world-class epidemiologists. Either side could veto for any reason. So they had to be people that both sides were convinced were, were unbiased, most world-renowned epidemiologists in the field. We picked that panel, amazingly enough. We were able to get agreement. We picked these three panelists. And those, panel, those panelists were told to look at all of the data that's out there, not just published peer-reviewed articles, most of which had been by the industry at that point, but also the internal documents that had not been published. But also, very critically, that panel was given the ability to do their own study of the community. The problem is when you ask people to volunteer for a study, not many people are going to show up. And so uh, who's going to do this? We want to get this thing up and running because the momentum was there, the case had been settled. So we put a lot of information out in ads and pamphlets, you name it, every, every type of media we could get our hand, we flooded the market. Healthy drinking water is vital to all of us. That's why scientists need to know if the chemical C8 causes any health problems. By completing a health questionnaire and having your blood tested, you can help. And you may be paid up to $400. To get started, call one 800 We ended up also using that money to pay class members to come in and have their blood tested for PFOA and to provide access to their medical information. Virtually the entire affected population, estimated at 70,000 people, participated. They designed the most world-class studies that have ever been done on a pollutant. They designed 12 different studies. They ended up getting data from 69,000 people. They spent seven years what other chemical do you have this kind of information about? The science is unequivocal now. And in 2012, they said that there was a link between drinking this in the water and six different diseases. Kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, preeclampsia, and high cholesterol. So the science panel resulted in numerous publications that really laid the foundation for what we now know about the relationship between PFAS exposure and the potential for adverse health effects. And in some ways, it becomes a mistake to focus on that one very large first study because since then, multiple other studies 
have looked at similar outcomes and other outcomes in many other populations around the world. For example, there are now more than 15 studies showing links to cholesterol, more than five showing links to abnormal higher liver functions in uric acid, and three different populations, to my knowledge, that pregnancy-induced hypertension has been denoted. Other studies completely addressed the relationship between exposure to the two most common PFAS and diminished response to vaccines and other aspects of immune downregulation, which at this point is one of the most certain outcomes of health exposure and also obviously one of general public health concern. In addition to that, Dr. Rogers has mentioned reproductive outcomes such as the inevitability of transplacental transport and transport by breastfeeding to newborns so that most infants and young children have higher PFAS serum concentrations than their mothers. I have to say, in the few months that I've been studying PFAS, it's been such a wonderful break to interface with environmental chemists and toxicologists. I didn't see all the drama and misinformation that plagues nutrition. They're solid science, usually without a profit motive or some emotional attachment to a favorite diet. And they understand epidemiology. They have to. They can't do randomized trials on lead and asbestos and PCBs. But we still must know whether these chemicals are causal of disease. Don't get me wrong, nutrition has great scientists. They're just not the ones writing pop best-selling books. Food giants have done a brilliant job of shaking the public's confidence in epidemiology from Coca-Cola to the beef industry. Coke isn't linked to pancreatic cancer, don't you know? Those are just observational studies. Weak sauce. Nutrition scientists who understand epidemiology didn't fall for that, but many pop book authors with little background in epidemiology were easy prey for food company disinformation. Understanding epidemiology does take a strong understanding of statistics and big data, and few nutrition influencers have that. I have many friends at Google, and I watched them crush other search engines, even though they were late to the game, because they understood better than anyone how to extract signal from noise in big, confounded data. For non-scientists who want an example of how statistics can be so powerful and yet so not intuitive, I give you Brad Pitt. He gets on base. We are card counters at the blackjack table. We're going to turn the odds on the casino. You're discounting what scouts have done for 150 years? What is happening in Oakland? It defies everything we know about baseball. Just plain crazy. Moneyball is the story of how statistics would prove the best professional scouts and managers wrong, win the World Series, and revolutionize baseball. The game is really smart. In fact, I would say that baseball has become one of the most intelligent industries in the world, in my opinion. Uh, and you see it now with the use of analytics. The, the, the people running baseball teams are much different than when I started. So what gave the C8 panel study high enough statistical power to infer with a high degree of confidence causality for those six conditions despite the big confounders of diet and lifestyle? It had to stand up in court despite the expert witnesses that DuPont paid to cast doubt. Number one, 70,000 people. Number two, seven years. Number three, the high incidence of disease, which provided a lot of cases. Number four, the number of study participants who had been exposed even longer than seven years. Number five, the 12 other studies they did. I could go on. So how do you and I get exposed? Is water really the main pathway? Because that's what's in all the headlines. Environmental chemists and toxicologists may have been late to the game due to DuPont's dark secret, but you know who's still oblivious? Nutrition scientists, even the ones I deeply respect. To Ken Berry's credit, he recently did an episode on PFAS focused on water and clothes, but no mention of food. Medcram did a well-informed episode worth watching, but also nothing about food. It was environmental chemist Lydia Jahl who got me to do this episode. So, Lydia, you have a PhD in chemistry. I do. And she brought in Kyla Bennett, who used to work at the EPA. I decided to go straight to law school after getting my PhD. And then I actually worked at EPA for 10 years before I came to Peer. They bombarded me with papers from toxicology journals. And this one had a table that really caught my attention. It's a list of different studies and how they estimated the exposure pathways of PFOS. The column on the left lists two PFOS chemicals, a small sample of the thousands of others that exist but haven't been studied as thoroughly yet. What jumps out at me is how big a role food plays. To me, food looks like the elephant in the room, at least 70% of the problem. 
This seems like really good news for people who are willing and able to adjust their diets. I thought water or exposure to skin would have a bigger impact than these studies show. Kyla and Lydia did caution me, though, that non-food exposure can have big impacts, such as for ski waxers. Unfortunately, many commonly used waxes contain per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS, which are then released into the air, water, and snow near ski and snowboard areas, posing health risks to humans and wildlife. The famed ski town of Park City, Utah, home to the largest ski resort in the United States, recently banned fluorinated wax after PFAS were found in groundwater wells. For skiers and snowboarders, exposure to harmful chemicals in wax and cleaning solvents might be a bigger concern than previously known, according to new research. Those skiers don't realize that their PFAS ends up in people's water wells. And how does it get into our food? Brace yourselves. Before the farmer and the lawyer exposed DuPont's dark secret, wastewater facilities didn't know about PFAS. They have the problem with uh, <clears throat> solids left after treatment. So they sold waste solids cheap to farmers as fertilizer. Seemed like a good idea at the time. The problem is the forever chemicals in the wastewater they didn't know about survived the treatment. Kyla explains. First, biosolids have massive amounts of PFOS. It's from everything we wash down the drain. Think about it. You wash your makeup off and the PFOS in the makeup goes down the drain. Your non-stick pans are washed. Your clothing with PFOS is washed. You wash your PFOS-laden carpets and put that water down the drain. I could go on forever. And this brings up another tragedy of forever chemicals. This is all I've ever done. It's all I've wanted. It was all taken away from me in one swoop a big business dumping PFAS down the drain. Why in God's green earth would you want to sell something that you know is contaminated? I had one person, honest to God, told me, well, you know, Freddie, you screwed up. So all you had to do was keep your mouth shut. We knew right away it was the biosolids, that that was the culprit of where everything was coming from. Biosolids were a great fertilizer source for us to, to go along with the operation. When they were found on Grostick's land more than a year ago, Michigan regulators shut down his farm and ordered a seizure notice. He's now barred from selling his meat indefinitely. As the cows ingest the, the feed and um, they drink the water, it gets into the cows themselves and it, it translates into the milk. The presence of these chemicals in the milk caused Stone to lose his dairy license, leaving his third generation family business in ruins. The farmers had nothing to do with that. They didn't even know what PFAS was. And no regulator wants to destroy somebody's dreams like that. But what are they supposed to do? Let the food go to market and destroy kids' immune systems and give adults kidney cancer? Fortunately, those farms are in Michigan and Maine, and those states have aid packages for farmers, but they still can't compensate. And if you're thinking, I knew Chris was going to go there with a channel named Plant Chompers, you knew he was going to diss meat and dairy. Let me set the record straight on that right now because I give you Dr. Christopher Higgins, a distinguished professor at Colorado School of Mines, who's done a lot of research on that. It can accumulate, some of the chemicals can accumulate in fish. Uh, other sorts of, the, of these chemicals can accumulate in things like plants. And, and so depending on which compound you're looking at, you can have exposure through your, your meat or dairy or, uh, or fish and others you might uh, actually observe more through, through a plant-based diet. Okay, so being a vegetarian does not mean I'm excluded from PFAS. Correct. I spent days reading studies about what produce contains PFAS and ended up staring at charts like this. Who knows why the particular strawberries they checked were high in Belgium, but nowhere else in Europe? Ditto for pears from the Czech Republic. Before I go on, you may notice a whole variety of units from the papers I'm citing and wonder why. Actually, George Washington explained it. Because we are free men, and we will be free to measure liquids in liters and milliliters, but not all liquids, only soda, wine, and alcohol. <laughs> only those, sir. Yes, because for milk and paint, we will use gallons, pints, and quarts, God will. Okay. How many liters are in a gallon, sir? Nobody knows. <laughs> The most common units in the U.S. are parts per trillion with a T. 
It is really hard to visualize parts per trillion. The EPA says on its website that a part per billion with a B is one drop in a residential swimming pool. They say one part per trillion is one drop among 20 Olympic-sized pools. A part per trillion is on the edge of detectability, but the EPA now says even that is too high. So what is a testing official to do? Those fish are really kind of the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. We met Summer Streets up north in Duluth. She's a research scientist for Minnesota's Pollution Control Agency. If we just sample water, a lot of times we will get non-detects, and so we may not know if there's an issue with PFAS in the fish, but because the fish accumulate PFAS to a great degree, we get a better idea of the actual condition of the water body. The good news is parts per trillion is the same as the other units you commonly see, one nanogram per liter or one nanogram per kilogram. The metric system is awesome that way, so it's not like Fahrenheit and centigrade. We should have two different unrelated scales of temperature. One of them will make sense to the entire world, and the other will be super random. Our great nation will use the random one. <laughs> What is the scale called, sir? Fahrenheit. Spell that for me. Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out there are a few reasons why PFAS levels in produce vary all over the place. Here's the first. The state is in the process of doing research to try to figure out kind of safe levels. So they've set them for some things. They've set it for beef. They've set it for chickens. For some odd reason, it pulls up into leafy greens easier than it does into like fruits. So if you have a tomato plant, you might find it in the leaves, but it wouldn't be as much in the tomato. But if you grow kale or lettuce um, in PFAS contaminated land, it, it shows up in that stuff m in much higher levels. So they're trying to figure out why that is. And part of that research is to look to see how they can help the farmers with the impacted land pivot to maybe growing something else that is not, that does not uptake the PFAS as much. Fascinating. I followed up on that, and here's what she's saying. Research suggests that crops such as asparagus, corn, potatoes, rhubarb, squash, and tomatoes could still be grown on farms with PFAS contamination. For some crops like corn, this is because the stock absorbs the PFAS, but the kernels we eat do not. But other crops like lettuce, arugula, carrots, and spinach seem to absorb and store PFAS. Another is farms located near facilities that use firefighting foams like airports do. They are loaded with PFAS. It is impossible to get your head around how many sites that could be contaminated with PFAS. Remember the Michigan farm that had to be shut down? That contamination was traced to a chrome plating plant, which sent PFAS down the drain to a local wastewater treatment plant. We predicted that in the U.S. there's over 53,000 sites that have contamination. In fact, I think that we think that's a very conservative number and it's probably many more. So that brings up the most important question. What foods absorb the most PFAS if they are exposed? Well, I have to modify some things I've said about how fish may be healthy in modest amounts because freshwater fish in America is nasty, especially around the Great Lakes. An environmental working group study revealed that eating one freshwater fish equals a whole month of drinking tainted forever chemicals water. That headline puts math to the point that while drinking contaminated water is bad, eating contaminated food can be much worse. It's taking much longer to pollute our oceans with PFAS and get them to the levels of our freshwater lakes and streams in America because the oceans are so huge. But the FDA recently made a statement about seafood that wasn't exactly confidence inspiring. They said the data on PFAS and seafood is still very limited. However, our testing indicates that seafood may be at higher risk for environmental PFAS contamination compared to other types of foods. Speaking of the FDA, they have a program to measure the PFAS levels in various kinds of foods. Here is some of their data collected on contaminated farms. The first thing to notice is the levels in collards and kale in particular are too high. But the levels from dairy are crazy high. They're insane. Note that dairy was high in a type of PFAS called PFOS, but produce had mostly PFOA. So many acronyms. A doctor asked me, but weren't both discontinued years ago, and we've seen levels of both of them dropping in Americans? That is true, but they started making substitutes. There's now something like 5,000 of them, including the popular one, Gen X. But the US EPA deems two Gen X PFAS chemicals more toxic than PFOA. And so what happens is we don't follow the precautionary principle. We allow 
companies to put these chemicals in commerce. And then if we, the scientists, find out it's harmful, they take it out. But what happens is they often replace the toxic chemical with a chemical cousin that's just as toxic. And we call this chemical whack-a-mole. And it's this never-ending game that's been played for decades. It happens all the time, and, and we sometimes call it uh, regrettable substitution is the less playful name for it. But it's another name I don't like, you know, because it implies there's, oh, whoops, we made a mistake. It's a regrettable substitution. Whoops. Unfortunately, most tests only measure about 16 of those chemical cousins. But when they do, this is what they find. We, we found that newer PFAS detections are doubling globally in breast milk every four years. The whack-a-mole game has five moles. The PFOS game has 5,000. Here we come, the whack-a-moles popping out of our holes. Sorry, pal, you can't catch me. To whack one PFOS mole takes years of scientific research, and then you have to take the chemical companies to court only to have them tell the jury, didn't these scientists know that correlation doesn't equal causation? Back to food, as crazy as the levels of PFOSs were in dairy from contaminated farms, the levels of PFOS in freshwater fish in America are crazy plus plus. What this graphic is trying to show is it only takes four servings of average freshwater fish to almost double the levels of PFOS in your blood compared to the average American, whose PFOS levels are already unsafe. That's if you're lucky and got average fish. If you're unlucky, it only takes one serving. What other foods did the FDA test? I'll provide links in the description, but ocean-going fish was way better than freshwater fish. For example, this is some wild cod from various countries. Some of the samples were below the minimum detectable limit, but that wasn't fully comforting because the FDA's instruments were not very sensitive. A few samples were at the level of kale grown on contaminated farms. Tilapia and salmon fared better than cod for some reason, but again from instruments with a high minimum detectable limit. The bad news is shellfish were nuts, like freshwater fish in America. Here are the numbers from clams. Insane. Crabs and lobster were bad too. Um, I tested lobsters in Massachusetts. Horrifying <laughs> levels of PFAS. To the point where it's dangerous to have one lobster dinner. Also nuts, liver. Here's a warning from Wisconsin for deer sampled near an old military base. It's a do not eat advisory for deer liver in that area. They said the muscle meat in those deer had much lower levels of PFOS. I saw so many warnings about liver that I bought popular liver supplements to send out to test. The Liver King claims to have sold $100 million worth of liver supplements in a year. I'm testing several other things like PFOS levels in my blood and my wife Tony's. And when the tests come back, I'll post another episode with the results, no matter what the outcomes are. Processed and fast food seem to have the next highest levels of PFOS after fish, dairy, and beef. Of course, they contain fish, dairy, and beef, but it's thought that some of their PFOS comes from the wrappers and pizza boxes that are coated with PFOS to avoid water and grease stains. The PFOA and PFOS are being phased out of that packaging, but they're being replaced by their chemical cousins, which are also proving to be hazardous. So what about plants? This shouldn't be a diatribe issue because we're all getting a significant amount of our PFOS from plants, either directly or secondhand through animals. The European Food Safety Authority reported modeling where forages like grass and alfalfa represented 78% of PFOS exposure in ruminants, while soil accounted for more than 80% in outdoor poultry, eggs, and pigs. We should all be concerned about the levels of PFOS we're seeing in plants, but why are they so much lower than we're seeing in fish, dairy, and meat? I asked Lydia, we were talking about pesticides at that moment, but the same principle applies. Where does your chicken or your cow get all its muscle and flesh that you're eating? It's eating even higher volumes of plants than you might eat. Um, and then those pesticides will bioaccumulate in the, the cow, and then you eat the cow. So it's the same story of bioaccumulation with PFAS and fish, for example. To put some numbers to what she's saying, for every 100 calories of grain fed to farmed animals, you only get 40 calories of milk, 22 calories of eggs, 12 calories of chicken, 10 calories of pork, and 3 calories of beef. And for some tragic reason, the bioaccumulation factor is high in milk. The breast milk comes from 10 women who are breastfeeding their first child and who live within a radius of 7 kilometers around Camors. The research shows that their milk contains, on average, 10 times more PFAS than the standard permits. 
Speaking of bioaccumulation, I got curious about uptake from different foods. This paper concluded the concentration of several PFAs in blood appears to be reduced by dietary fiber. Another thing is, when exposed to PFAS contamination, all animals bioaccumulate it, whereas many staple crops like corn and potatoes do not. I don't know how many of us are getting a lot of calories from greens, unlike cows who love alfalfa and grass. I'll link an interesting paper about sheep who became contaminated from grass. There are a few studies comparing vegan PFAS levels with omnivores, like this one from a German food safety institute. Among the 72 people in that study, vegans were somewhat lower than omnivores, averaging 6.4 nanograms per milliliter as opposed to 7.6 in their blood. My interpretation is the results were influenced by the crazy high PFOS levels of seven vegans who had been vegan for less than five years. It takes years for PFOS levels to reduce in the body. There is no 10-day detox for PFAS. But after five or 10 years, there were no vegans in the study with crazy high levels. The authors produced a fascinating heat map of where four different PFOSs were coming from for all the study participants. They included two PFOSs we haven't talked about. Big dots mean big contributions. Blue dots correlate with lower PFOS levels. So fruit was moderately associated with lower levels of two PFOSs and moderately higher levels of two others. Water was a big contributor for PFOA. When you add the items omnivores were eating, you see more big red dots. These Berliners weren't eating much seafood, so meat and meat products were bigger for them than seafood. Eggs didn't seem to be much of a factor, although they can be when the chickens are raised on fish meal. Wildlife that eat higher in the food chain also have higher PFOS levels. The carnivores with crazy high levels are marine mammals, and they are having a terrible impact on coastal communities that depend on them. We have no production of chemicals, but we are exposed to a lot of chemicals. They came to us without our asking us. This is a price to pay for what the international society have done without thinking about the consequences. Speaking of carnivores, a rare California condor landed near me while I was hiking in the mountains and he walked towards me with wings wide open. When he got to point-blank range, I thought of the Gary Larson cartoon where vultures say, forget patience, I want to kill something. But it turns out he liked the sunglasses I was rocking, so he stole them. Another thing we learned from human studies is women of childbearing age usually have lower PFOS levels than men do. That's because they pass a lot of their PFAS onto their babies. And also they lose blood through menstruation. Turns out it's very effective to give blood. Here's a dramatic example from a couple who was exposed to very high PFAS levels. And we can actually go back and calculate what our, what our exposure was, and it was really high. In my case, five million parts per trillion. Carrie's blood tests came back below the national average, which experts told us is likely because she sold so much of her blood when the family so desperately needed money. She was, in, in fact, moving these chemicals out of her body. It's actually a mechanical process. They're losing blood and the PFAS are leaving their body. If you're surprised to discover the strong link between PFAS and food, welcome to the club. Here's a common path of discovery. Now, I'm a doctor and a researcher. I went to medical school. I've been in medical practice for almost 20 years. With Dr. Cohen, her beloved golden retriever died of liver disease at four. But his illness opened my eyes up to a whole nother world called environmental health. And let me tell you, I was shocked and enraged. Where are the regulations, the consumer protections? Where's the labeling? and the appropriate testing. I have watched over 30 webinars in the dark of the night when I should have been sleeping, and they typically go like this. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Jonathan Ali. I'm the toxicologist with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. With PFAS, the primary source of exposure or the route of exposure that we're concerned with is through ingestion. So that can either be ingestion of drinking water or contaminated food items. It turns out chemical companies like DuPont were able to capture the EPA. The governmental agencies that should have been responsible, the EPA, those people were captured by DuPont. It's called corporate capture. So a group of states decided the cavalry wasn't coming and they banded together. The onus was on the manufacturers to tell EPA if they thought there was a problem with their chemical. 
So that pretty much didn't happen. So we don't know who's using them. We don't know when they're being released. We, we really don't have the normal ways of getting a handle on a situation um, because they're not regulated in so many of these areas. EPA does have a, an action plan for, this, for these chemicals. It's more of a plan than action. <laughs> in terms of states being in the lead, a number of states are actually um, are in the process of establishing their own state drinking water regulations. This is pretty unusual. States don't do this. This takes a lot of time and resources, and they usually defer to the feds. Most of those 30-plus webinars I watched were from scientists at state agencies or nonprofits. They're very solid chemists or toxicologists who are not getting rich or famous doing this. And they have to deal with politics and the chemical companies who work to discredit them. In our deeply polarized nation, something like half the population abhors any kind of regulation and works to defund it. Do we really want toxic chemicals to be a political issue or even a financial one? I did an episode on why Americans live seven years shorter lives than other wealthy nations while spending twice as much per capita on health care. And a very significant part of that was that other countries invest in prevention while we spend on emergency care. The funding for these agencies seemed like a lot, but when you compare it to the trillions we spend on health care, it's not even a blip. I don't think it's a coincidence that the states leading the charge have life expectancies in the high 70s, and the states that are lagging have life expectancies in the low 70s. And I would say this map is heavily biased by how much testing has happened in different places, so we don't have a systematic testing effort that's gone on. Places that don't have any dots probably haven't looked. Um, Michigan looks like it's just the hotbed for PFAS, but it's because they're out in front and they've done a lot of testing. We don't hate firemen for imposing regulations on us, and I don't think we should hate the people in these agencies for trying to save us. I think the people working to do something about these chemicals are heroes. This guy is yeah. a hero. He really he is. is. He, he's a hero. He's a hero not because you want to be him, but because you see how hard it was to be him. Yeah. yeah. He, yeah. he really took the journey that very few of us take, and it's an honor to be sitting here with well, him. Thanks. 